Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hello, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. This is Monica Profit. I'm here with Alex Progshot, I think. Um, don't yeah. make me spell that. I'm not sure, but you can find it in the notes. Uh, he is the co-author of an upcoming book, Self-Sovereign Identity. He has co-authored it with Drummond Reed, who I'll be interviewing later in this pod, in another podcast. And he's been huge in the blockchain space. We have so many places to touch on your bio. Thank you so much, Alex. Please say your full name and so we can know how I've butchered it so far. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. No, it's great. And thanks so much for having me. Uh, so please tell me your full name. How do how do I pronounce that again? Did I get that it, right? It, you, you did it perfect. I think you, like one of the persons that did it the best. Um, like, and it's Parkshot. It's a German last name. So yeah, no, you did it perfectly. Oh, good. I don't even know German. Yeah. So I, I feel yeah. like I know a little bit of German now. Thank you. <laughs> um, so can you tell me a little bit about how you got into publishing this particular book? I know you've got several other books that came in behind that. And you, that's, that have, you've been already uh, published author in several, several different topics. But in specifically with Self-Sovereign Identity, how did this come to pass? How did you decide I've got to write a book about this? Yeah, I, I got started in, in, in self-sovereign identity in 2017. And um, it's an incredibly co- new and complex and, and, and powerful um, technology, like in combination with blockchain. And um, like for the people that have been spending a couple of years in the blockchain space, I think it, um, we're still struggling, like just to understand the basics and like the dynamics of what is happening there. But as SSI or self-sovereign identity, that's even bigger in terms of complexity and interesting stuff that you can do with that. And I think one of the key things is that for many of the things we want to do in the decentralized economy, um, you really need decentralized identity. And uh, so understanding what identity is, how it works, and how, how it might work in the future with, uh, in a decentralized way is a key aspect. And that's what got me into it. And as, as I was digging deeper and deeper into the whole subject, I was like thinking, oh man, I, I need to write this up. And for me, writing books or articles and stuff like that helps me to structure my own ideas and to learn. And, and, and I thought, hey, this is a big project, but let's get it started. And so we signed up with Manning, which is one of, one of the big technology publishers in the, in the United States. And yeah, we've been working on this now for 18 months and we still have like another four or five months going before it will be published. And um, I think, I hope it will help everyone to go deep into this and see how this helps the decentralized economy. Absolutely. How did you find Drum and Reed? Was it something that you had already worked together before? Did you know him from the space? Were you just, I mean, is there a Craigslist for this? Is there a decentralized <laughs> a sovereign, a sovereign identity list that you can say, hey, who else believes this is important? Let's talk about it. No, yeah, no, no. We, we, we started working together in 2017 and we did different things together at the same company. Um, and we, um, we well, well, actually, we still work together at, at Evident, which is the company we work, uh, which is one of the leading companies in the SSI space around the world. And, and so I, and in Drummond, he, he's like one of the key reference guys around the world for self sovereign identity. Like the identity community they, or the decentralized digital identity community, they've been working on the subject like for 15 years. And self sovereign identity really came up as a big theme in 2016 when, when um, self sovereign, well, decentralized digital identity and blockchain kind of got combined and this concept of self sovereign identity got created, which hopefully will help people to control the data. Um, and, and without that data living in silos and to be able to decide when other people or companies access that data or how you monetize that data in a completely decentralized way. And, and that's, when I get, that's when I got started and I told him, hey, Raman, I've been now like six years working in this blockchain space. You've been working like 15, 20 years in the identity space. Let's put our efforts together um, and, 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 and getting something like this out. And so what we've been doing, we've been like leading this book, but um, we've got um, people involved from the whole industry and from the whole ecosystem. We have like 20 different authors collaborating. We are editing and making sure everything fits. And um, yeah, and we have like, the book has four big parts. The first part is like a general introduction because identity 
when, when you ask people um, about it, people a lot of times they think, oh, identity, is, is it my identity card, is my passport or something like that? And in reality, identity is much, much bigger because it's basically everything you do in your life, like um, everything you do in your social life, with whom you relate to, everything that's basically all. Every single all... click you make, if you, if you like something, if you buy something, if you have a house plant, if you have a cat, for example. Everything. Exactly, exactly. It, it's all those things. It's all part of your identity, but it's it's very distributed. And, and with self sovereign identity, the hope is, is that you will be able to bring that together. So all those concepts, that's what we try to explain in the first part. Then we explain in the second part how the technology works and what the key blocks are for the technology. There are specific concepts, like the concepts like verifiable credentials, um, which is one specific aspect of self sovereign identity, decentralized identifiers, and then of course a lot of cryptography, which is unfortunately or fortunately part of the whole thing, which is often very complicated to understand. We explain in the third part the whole setup of the ideology and philosophy of um, um, decentralization, which is very dear to our heart because that's what we believe in. And then finally, in the fourth part, we explain the use cases. How will this change banking? How will it change health? How will it change that's a lot huge. of different industries and sub subjects? And it's a very similar format to what we did like a couple of years ago when we wrote another book about blockchain in a Spanish speaking world. And that book became really, really successful there with that format. And then and we thought, okay, hey, let's do the same for, for the world because um, there's nothing like that for the world yet. And, and really bring the whole concept of self sovereign identity closer to everyone. So I think it will be one of the big things because when I started with blockchain, it was still very, very small. And when we started writing that book a couple of years ago, uh, in blockchain, I started writing that book like in 2016 and we published it in May 2017. And it, the whole blockchain space exploded in 2017. And I think something very similar will also happen with self sovereign identity, maybe in a year, two years, who knows. And, and we hope that by that time, people will then have access to this book and be able to educate themselves. So when you mentioned the four parts of the book, the first one being just uh, the entire landscape of what the digital identity looks like. Um, and I said something about, um, you know, everything that you, that you click on are like, right? <clears throat> and it makes me wonder, um, and a lot of our, of our listeners don't know, you know, in depth, everything about DLT or like uh, the digital you know, ledger technology or blockchain technology. This is where people are coming to learn. But when I think about someone being able to own their identity, withhold their identity and still like things or engage um, um, on the internet, I have to wonder, what are your thoughts on that turning people into trolls in a way? Because, you know, one thing that people have, have done more now that they have this this perceived distance between themselves and their fellow man. They can just go onto blogs, they can go onto platforms, and they control people. And they feel as though that's, mm -hmm. that's appropriate. It's something that they would never say to someone's face. They would never say to a stranger's face. It's like this complete lack yeah. of, of you know, manners that can follow people around because of their perceived distance from one another in this digital world, this landscape. Mm -hmm. But if you go a further step and you remove someone's identifying features at all, which of course, yes, in like Reddit, you can have a screen name, things like that. But if it's completely removed, do you feel as though uh, we have any indicators that that would make people more likely to troll or do you see other indicators where that could, you know, have a different outcome? Well, I, I think bo both things would continue happening because I think it's like with the whole internet, what, what we've learned and, and like any new technology that comes up, a lot of, like a lot of good things that happen with that new, with those new technologies and also bad things. And I think like with uh, the internet and uh, with this global network that we have right now, because you have the negative side that, we, that we've been discovering in the last couple of years, but like, Oh man, it's like um, you get chased and um, you have no privacy and all those different things that, that happen in, in the internet when, when, when you and also when you're a public figure. And, and, but then all the, also all the benefits, like we can go really deep now, like you have like um, advantages like this podcast right now, like I mean, um, which podcasting maybe 10 years ago was a, still like a very niche thing. And now it has become like a big, big thing. And it's only possible because we have these technologies where you're sitting in New York, I'm sitting in Madrid, and we can do this global thing. So that's, that, those are the advantages. And going back to your question, I think, um, I think self-sovereign identity will cover a lot of those things depending on the choices of people. But I think, and, and, and I think your podcast is, is very well titled in the sense that it's about the tr trust economy. And of course, if people can identify themselves and you have this decentralized identification systems that allow you, for example, to say, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a creator like you, like I have a podcast, then with self-sovereign identity, you will be able to sign all your creations with your private key and, and people will be able to verify, oh, this is really for Monica Profit. This is not just someone claiming to be or someone saying, be able to do this for, for your articles, for your podcast, for, for everything you do basically in your digital life. And, and then people will be question. able to... 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was my next but, question is, you know, if it's on one side, people could, you know, take advantage of the, of the um, ability to withhold one's information and, and become more anonymous in some sense. They also are very verified, right? So they could just be known by their, by their letter and number, numerical string or something, and therefore they might troll more often. But on the other side, isn't there, I'm not very, this is not my space. Um, the identity space is not so much my space, right? It's more DLT is my space and blockchain is my yeah. space. So I've, I've heard, you know, that there is a big threat to even to democracy and to government that's coming up that in terms of fake news and the ability to fake what somebody with a public figure said or did being able to do facial distortion or reconfiguration so that it can appear as though like say Monica Prophet said something that I would never say and it gets distributed and goes viral and it's unverified and I've, I wouldn't be able to take it back because I didn't actually generate it. So Abs is there a way absolutely. to actually verify? Is this like a some kind of self-sovereign identity is also the number one way to fight that sort of fake news opportunity that's coming with facial re reconfiguration? It's one of the big subjects, but I think it's like fake news, but it's also, you can even take it to something very basic, like imagine like um, journalists around the world making, um, um, quoting someone and saying, oh, I, I'm, this person said this. And then you can then say, well, um, I'm not signing that quote. So a journalist in the future might have to say, oh, you know, um, um, I, I want to um, publish this quote. Can you please sign it with your private key? Because then it's a f verified quote from that person. And that person, first of all, will not be able to deny that they ever said it because they've uh, signed it with the private key. So everyone will be able to verify that. And everyone will be able to verify also that uh, what the journalist is basically saying with that quote is true because it got signed with that private key. So that's a very basic, basic example, but which would be incredibly powerful already because a lot of people um, like um, of the famous people, they say, oh yeah, you know, I got misquoted or whatever, you know, you could get into this whole game where you can have a tr chain of trust around that. But then it also goes to the fake news where you could then verify those kind of things because everything will be kind of cryptographic, cryptographically verified. Yeah, I wonder if it's going to be something as simple as seeing um, like a C, like for, for a, something that a corporation is certified or a TM with for trademark. It's like WM watermarked or it's blockchain marked or DLT marked and, yeah. you know, SSI marked or something. And so you just, you have a quote and if it doesn't say that, then you know it, it hasn't been marked or it's got a QR code and you can go, you can make sure about it. It, it seems like we're really on the cusp of a very new a new economy where like trust is yeah. a new thing, right? It's either trust less or it's even more trusting. You can trust it more because it's verified. So. Absolutely. And that's why we talk very often also about the trust economy, because you provide a trust framework um, that allow people to, to trust each other and trust what, what is happening in, in, in decentralized ecosystems. So on the one hand, we provide decentralization. Um, and that's why we believe in that, because we believe that decentralization is something that will empower our democracies and our society. But at the same time, we provide trust to these decentralized ecosystems because um, you can verify those claims that are happening in these decentralized systems. Yeah, absolutely. How did you first get into blockchain? What is the, the moment when you realized you either learned something about the technology in some aspect and you said, I want to go that way? What, do you remember uh, that moment when you, when you moved in that direction? Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I remember it really well. I, in my case, it was the first time I saw, I mean, because before blockchain, there was Bitcoin really. And, and that was like in, in 2011, like April, May 2011, I saw a video from a guy um, talking about Bitcoin and I, and I got really, really intrigued and I thought, oh, I'm just going to dig deeper into this. Let, let's see what that is. And, 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 and then I forgot about it. And, but some people in my whole net and my social network and, and my work network kept insisting on me that, that I needed to dig deep on this. And then in 2013, I started digging deeper again. And this time I got really hooked. And um, yeah, and, and since then I've, I've been into the space. So initially there was the whole Bitcoin space and then slowly it, became, it broadened up, like people started calling it more blockchain in, in 2014, 15. And, um, and um, yeah, and, and I've been going with that wave since then. You know, you mentioned um, in, in earlier when we were talking before this podcast started, you mentioned that you are very passionate about the difference between blockchain and DLT, distributed ledger techno mm -hmm. te mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about, you know, that is not a hair that I've heard a lot of people passionately split. So why is, <laughs> why is this something you're passionate about? Yeah, it's, it's something that I'm passionate about because, um, um, because I, I think um, that, that from my point of view, it's, it's really important to see that no matter um, which side you take, like, and I usually divide um, the market between the blockchain space and the DLT space. And with the blockchain space, I usually mean the Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. And with the DLT, I usually mean like um, what people 
usually call private blockchains. And, and, and what I'm trying to say with this, um, the basic hypothesis in, in the market is in, in, in the blockchain space, um, what you have to see is that a lot of the people that, in, uh, that got initially interested in Bitcoin, Ethereum and all those things, uh, many of them were like um, cypherpunks. And, and the cypherpunks, basically, they had this philo philosophy that um, they, they want to provide um, strong cryptographic technological tools to the, to the weak or the people that had not, do not have enough power against the governments or the corporations of the world so that there would be a more balanced um, ecosystem. That's, that's basically the ideology. And also there's like a strong sense in, in that ecosystem uh, historically about well, we, we need as little state or government as possible. And, and that's a little bit the driver, okay? And um, I think in the DOT space, it's pretty different in the way it's approached. I think in the, in the DOT space, the way I think it's being approached is, well, actually governments, the state and everything works quite well. Um, um, and the only thing we need to do is to pre improve the systems we have in place so that um, they become more fashion efficient and more transparent and so on. And I think those, by the, um, those different aspects um, drive different lines in, in terms of, um, of technology. In terms of DLT, I think what um, a lot of these things that are trying to be done are like incremental improvements. And I think in the blockchain, it's more disruption in, 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 in a way. And I'm not trying to say that any of the two is really right or wrong, but um, historically, I've seen a lot of conflict between those two movements. And, um, and, and, and what is interesting, I think SSI is really sitting in the middle between the two because right. SSI is not like really like, oh, uh, we want to eliminate governments or anything like that. Um, but, they're also, but they're also like, well, you know what? We want to stop the surveillance economy. We don't want the big companies to exploit the data of the people, to monetize the data, or to eventually, in some cases, create digital dictatorships where where you just don't know what is happening with your life and it's being controlled by other people. So it's kind of in the middle there. And I think it's helpful to, to see a little bit of those things because beyond the conflict, what I've learned over time is that it's really important to understand the architecture of, of these decentralized ecosystems. But that's the most difficult thing because a lot of times the people working on these um, architectures, they don't understand themselves what they're doing because they're kind of building it as, as they go, they, they, just, they have a kind of a vision where they want to go, but they just don't know that how it will really look like. And, and, and this really happens in both spaces. So um, I think what, what is really interesting about this is I've seen very few things beyond Bitcoin and the blockchain space. In the blockchain or DOT space where you have real use cases, but what I strongly believe in is that in the SSI space, we have um, very strong use cases that are happening already right now and that will be happening in the big time in the future. And that will be very powerful and strong for both the blockchain space and the DLT space. Is this, um, are you linked in at all with the own your data campaigns that I've seen? Um, there are some folks here in the States that have been very, very dis, um, disenchanted with big corporations owning data and how it, how it can mm. manipulate all kinds of things all the way down to, you know, elections and things like that. And really the mm. desire to have the individual own their own data. Are you connected with the own your data campaign folks or? I, I'm not connected with them, but it's, it's very much related because, I mean, like um, in the SSI space, you, you have like different communities that come together. You have the, what I call the privacy nerds. That's the whole, all my data and all that stuff. Then you have the decentralization nerds. Then you have the open source nerds. You have like different communities that are all coming together in the space, each of them for their own reasons, but like with very similar goals in, in a way because they see that these technologies will provide them what, what they're looking for. So you mentioned something in um, our liner notes that I wasn't really sure what you exactly meant, but now it's starting to make sense to me. It was it mm -hmm. just said, trust, the trust over IP stack. What do you mean by trust over IP? I mean, for the average layman, you know, what does yeah. this actually mean to them in the trust over IP? Yeah, I mean, trust over IP, that's um, a very strong <laughs> concept that especially Drummond is working on and he, he, he's leading that. And trust over IP basically is, 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 the, is, the SS, is one way of modeling the SSI stack. So you have the blockchain or the, so, um, the source of truth um, level, which is layer one. Then on top of that, you, you, um, you, you have the uh, prot uh, protocol layer. On top of that, then you have an exchange layer, which basically means how do I exchange credentials between people so they can do it in a decentralized way. And then finally, uh, the final layer of that is, is called um, the governance framework layer, which is, okay, what are the legal frameworks that you need for, for different people to issue credentials in that framework? It's, it's a high level technical framework really to understand how you can build the SSI um, economy or the SSI networks, basically. So for any of the innovators that may be listening to this, how could they include and incorporate SSI into their technology or into their products? 
Um, yeah, um, it's, I mean, SSI, as I, I was mentioning before, like right now, it's, it's really sitting there in the middle between the blockchain and the, and the DLT space. I think like the blo in the blockchain space, um, I, I think that I call it sometimes the blockchain myopia. It's like they have been a very strong focus. Like in, I mean, when you talk to blockchain people, they tend to talk about, oh, this is the consensus model. These are the nodes and this is, is it proof of work or is it proof of stake or is it this or that? And the same happens a little bit in the DLT space. Um, um, in SSI, you have all those elements. But, uh, but, uh, but you need to understand it's, um, the, the language that has been developed around identity because you cannot only summarize it about, um, oh, I'm going to have a token and what is monetary value that identity in reality is much, much bigger than money because identity is basically what defines our lives. And, and I think it's also, um, I mean, these technologies, they have the power to be incredibly good for society. And, and make um, and, and give us freedom and liberty and make progress in our lives. But also all these technologies, and I think this happens in, in terms of money for the blockchain space, but it also happens in much more even for identity, they, 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 they can really facilitate um, digital dictatorships in the future. So if these kind of technologies don't get implemented the right way, um, um, that you could, we could have countries around the world that try to, to basically decide um, where you can go, when you can go, what you're allowed to do, what, what spaces are you allowed to enter, are you allowed to travel, yes or no, what kind of, uh, it's like this um, this chapter from, oh man, I forgot the name now, Black Mirror, no, there's like yeah, this chapter, yeah, you know, yeah. you saw that chapter, it's really famous. You could really create that, that kind of society with SSI if you don't implement it the right way. So, um, um, so it's really important um, to us that um, this happens in a decentralized way where it's um, non no specific group controlling it so that people can really benefit from that because if it's not implemented the right way then you can create this dystopian societies that that you get and that you can see in these kind of um series like like black mirror yeah absolutely well i just have a couple more questions about this one is um so how many contributing authors do you think you're ultimately going to have it sounds like you're pulling mm. a lot of people and that ties in also with my other question which is mm. um it looks like you're really positioned as a thought leader in this space do you have any or do your contributing authors have any specific projects that they are, are that are you know making this real in the space taking these ideas and making you know products for the average consumer to be looking out for and being aware of yeah. Yeah. I mean, w with this book, what, what we try to do, um, what we're trying to do is to make it really diverse. So um, we, we have incorporated all, all those key thinkers that have been doing this stuff for 15, 20 years, developing the ideas about identity. So that we have some wonderful people like Kalia Young, she, she um, together with, uh, with a person called InfoMiner, because she doesn't disclose his name. And um, they wrote a nice chapter about the whole evolution of the community. Um, and then we have the key people that have been developing these technologies, like verifiable credentials, for example, there we have Dan Burnett and David Chadwick, they, they were, they're like the leading thought leaders in that space. Drummond, he's one of the leading thought leaders in the governance framework space. For DIDs, we have Marco Sabadello and Drummond. And then for the use cases, we, we, we've taken um, 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 different thought leaders for, uh, for different, different verticals. So for example, there's one vertical. Um, where we, um, the, um, uh, there's a guy called Manny, he, he's living in the UK, and he has a company to create um, credentials for doctors. And um, I didn't know about this until I spoke to Manny um, at the time, and this is really interesting. As you dig deep into each um, vertical, you see like how they all need these trust solutions um, uh, for, the, for their own verticals. But in the case of the health sector in the UK, the NHS, um, they have a problem because the onboarding of doctors takes a really long time. Um, but they have a very strong need in, in onboarding doctors really quickly because they don't have enough doctors. So what they're trying to do is they're trying just, and it sounds like something very basic, but they try on average, uh, t they take on average anything from six weeks to two months oh, to, nice. to onboard, onboard a new doctor just to verify all the credentials are right and everything. So it takes a really long time to get the doctor into the hospital and he has to do a lot of paper, he or she, she they have to do a lot of paperwork. So when you, once you get all this digitalized, Suddenly you will do this click, 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 and boom, you can go and you can work in a hospital. Right. But this is just a basic use case. But the, in, in our paper world that we have today, um, and the processes are still so long and so slow, and you, you need to verify, verify so many items to make um, the elements trustworthy that, um, that it makes it inefficient. So the, these are the basic things. And then, of course, in the future, we will be able to do much cooler stuff as we were.
discussing before, like fake news and cross references and all kind of things. But th those are like the starting points of where we're seeing uh, this kind of stuff happening. This is happening already right now in, in the UK, for example. It's already happening in the UK now. How long do you think it will be until it's you know, a market that has any market share and it's like a common enough occurrence? I mean, the way it's happening right now is like they're doing proof of concepts and, and doing it on a small scale for, for, for a limited set of hospitals and then trying it out. Because I mean, it's like, I mean, what this technology will deliver is extremely promising and helpful, but you also need it to do the right, right way and, and just see, okay, what can go wrong? Because once you get it into production, you don't want to have any, any big shakeout. So I think it will still take some time. Uh, it's difficult to say, but I think maybe another two or three years until we see it in a bigger scale. But considering um, of, um, of what you're talking about and what we've been seeing in the blockchain space, I mean, I think this is like one of the most promising things in the short term. Absolutely. It's very promising. And I've, I've actually been uh, really enamored with the Own Your Data movement. So I was excited to interview you and find out more about the SSI specific space when really yeah. the, the worlds are kind of colliding. You know, this is a, this yeah. is a topic that definitely needs to be addressed. I'm so glad that you're writing so much about it. It sounds like not only this, but you, you published the first graphic novel about Bitcoin, which is also really cool. So somebody wants to just have an easy read about Bitcoin and not have to actually dig into the, the hard part. They want to some pictures along with it. Now they've got a place to go for that. We've got to put that in, yeah, in the show notes as well. But uh, I just want to thank you for, for all your work in the SSI space. This is wonderful. And I, now I want to put you in touch with my Own Your Data people in case you're looking for more people to, to be a part of your book. When can we Absolutely. expect the book to come out? When is it going to be published? Do you know? Um, yeah, we hope that hopefully by September or by the end of this year, that, that's what we're hoping for. So we're still working on finalizing chapters. Like also because each of the chapters we write, goes, they go all through review process. And then based on the review we get, uh, on the feedback we get, we basically edit the book and, uh, and, and make changes to the book. So we still have to publish a couple of chapters, get review on them. And then once we have that ready, then we'll go out and we'll all get, um, yeah, and hopefully you will see it in September, the earliest, maybe latest by the end of this year. All right. That's great. Well, it's kind of like herding cats, like most big projects. So I'm so glad you're doing the, the heavy lifting and the undertaking of this project. It's going to be great. When it comes out, we'd love to do another, um, another interview just to see you know, how it's going, how it's received, what kind of feedback you've gotten. That'll be fantastic. I wish you had the book to hold up. So once you have one, I'd love to get a copy and, and get a, sh a shot to read it. This is going to be so exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, actually, the first eight chapters of the book um, are available already. So people can read them all already online um, and you can pre-order the book. Um, uh, it's like if you search for Manning's self sovereign identity, um, or, um, you can get it or maybe you want to put the link there. And um, yeah, so happy to receive feedback on that, too, because that's we're trying to incorporate as much feedback as possible. And then hopefully by the time it goes out, most people will be happy when, when they read it and say, OK, this really helps me to understand what this is about. That is the whole point, right? We got to educate yeah. people about what's now becoming available as even an option of what you can own about yourself and, and make sure you have private and, and there's no reason why someone else should be benefiting from your information when you can benefit from it yourself. So thank you so much for putting this out. Alex, um, I just, I'm so glad that you've been doing this work and I, I can't wait to put the links. We're going to put links to the first eight available chapters um, as well as as things continue to develop, just continue to send us more and we will definitely continue to put that up and put it out. So thank you so much, Alex. Um, this has been fantastic. Do you have anything else you'd like to close with? It sounds like we kind of covered the world's the world's problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if anyone is interested in learning more about um, SSI, you can also check out ssimeetup.org, which has become one of the main communities in the SSI space. And we have plenty of learning materials there. <laughs> we publish all materials with the Creative Commons by Share Like License, which with the Google slide decks and the webinars and slideshare.net um, so that you can reuse the material and people are creating local communities around the world. So we have, all over the world people have been using it, but they have been also creating local SSI meetup communities. The first one came up in, in Korea, and so and I think more of them will be popping up. So we, that's another way about how we're trying to, to encourage people to get into the SSI space. Well, that's fantastic. I'll definitely make sure there's a link to the SSI meetup. Um, and that looks like uh, you're going to be doing that in more and more places throughout the world as you travel with the book tour as well, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really separate from the book. It's just something else that we started doing two years ago. Um, and it kind of has become really, really successful. But I think it's just because when we started, this was really small and has been growing and growing and we've been growing together with the space. Well, that's great. I'm so glad that we got to learn about Meetup as well, the SSI Meetup. And um, yeah, thank you so much again for coming on. Um, I guess that's, we're going to wrap it up now with that. And uh, this is Monica Prophet signing off with Alex Proikshat.
at the New Trust Economy. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thank Thank you guys so much. You've been listening to the New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at New Trust Economy. Thanks for exploring the New Trust Economy with us.